Okay. <laughs> um, much of the surprise of, peop of many people, um, we're entering into the season of Shavuot. How many of you are familiar with Shavuot? Not, not very many. Okay, this will be an interesting new experience. Um, the um, Shavuot, a lot of people think that the feasts and the festivals all came down with Moses, but actually they didn't. There's ancient writings that if you go back and you review some of them, you'll find out that the, uh, a lot of the, the Moeds, the feasts and the festivals, they actually came down prior to Adam being created because all of this was a plan of God, okay? Just like what we're doing here today is a part of the plan of God. So uh, as we go into this, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you an introduction basically to what Shavuot is, but I'm also gonna tell you about the stories that are behind it a little bit to tie it all together where you understand why it is so important that as a body that we all share in these feasts and festivals. These, uh, the feasts and festivals are called moeds, and they're called that because they are covenantal relationships with God, okay? That means that when you enter into one of these feasts and festivals, you are actually entering into an expression of the covenant that we have with him. And covenantal relationships are very important to God. That's why marriage is in such trouble in this country today because when they bring marriage into a relationship where it's no longer a man and a woman, then what you're doing is you're violating a covenantal relationship with God. And so this is why covenant is so important. And this is why it is so important for believers to be functioning under, <clears throat> excuse me, under the relationship of covenant, but to function under the relationship of it, you have to understand all of the features of it. It's very important that that's a part of it. But what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about Shavuot. Now Shavuot is also known as the day of Pentecost. Now a lot of people think that today is Shavuot, but unfortunately it's not. And the reason it's not is because you're thinking of it from, uh, you're not thinking of it from the Jewish mindset. According to Judaism, the evening and the morning are the first day. Now, this is what it tells us in Genesis. So, actually, at sundown today, you will see Shavuot begin. I didn't want to do that. <laughs> you will see Shavuot begin. Now, right here where this little yellow box is, that's where Shavuot actually starts today at sundown. And you can't really see it that well on this slide, but right here, that's Sivan 6. This is the month of Sivan. Up here in this corner, you can see it's, it's Sivan. And Sivan 6 is actually the day of Shavuot on the Jewish calendar. So today at sunset, it begins. And it will go until tomorrow at sunset. And it will end tomorrow at sunset. So you're really in a good place because you're actually going to get a teaching on Shavuot before it actually happens. So if you want to really experience it, then you can. Amen. Now then, I'm sure that everyone will recognize these verses. The first one is Malachi 3.6, I am God, I change not. The second one is Hebrews 13 verse 8, Yeshua is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now these verses are the foundation and the filter of everything I study and teach, okay? The reason for that is I'm, and I'm always alert to the fact that the one stable factor in all of life is not mankind, but it's Yehovah, okay? Yehovah and his love for mankind is the thing that we hold on to. And just as her child relies on the reliability and the stability of the parent, so we are to rely on the reliability, we're to hold fast to the reliability and the stability of Yehovah. Because if it was not for him, he framed the worlds, okay? He framed the universe. And if he even once removed his hand from it, the whole thing would blow up. He is the stable factor that holds it all together. And we have to get that in our minds 
Because until we get that in, the, in our minds, we don't sense the depth that we rely on Him. And that's why it's very important that we understand that concept. And it's a hard concept to understand. Now, one of the, one of the things that I'm going to share a little bit with you is some of the traditions of Judaism that are uh, go- a little bit unnerving to Gentiles in general at best. Okay, For instance... In the Torah, which is the, uh, the first five books of the Bible, we are told, we are given all the outlines and the guidelines for the sacrificial system. Now, when the Messiah came, he did away with the law of sin and death. That's the only part of it that he gave away with, that he did away with. He took the place of the sacrificial lamb. The, the sacrifice is still in place, but he is the replacement for the lamb. So there when you see it, I am God, I change not. I put this into place in Leviticus. It hasn't changed. Now then, there is a prophecy in Judaism that before the return of the Messiah, shortly before the return of the Messiah, that the Ark of the Covenant will be brought out from its hiding place where it is currently sequestered, but it will be brought out on the backs of Gentiles. Okay. That says, oh, God changed. No, God didn't change, and I'll tell you why. In Judaism, if you are a Jew, and you begin to believe that that Yeshua is the Messiah, guess what you become? A Gentile. And I believe that, and I think God said that Kohanims, the Kohanim are the only ones that can carry the Ark of the Covenant. I don't have a problem with that. When it time comes time for the Ark of the Covenant to come out of its hiding place, the Kohanim will be tested with DNA, and it will show that even though it may be you, it may be you, it may be you, you may be a son, a child of the Most High God through the Le- Levitical priest line. And guess what? You are a Gentile. You may be a Jew. Your DNA will show you, and incidentally, there are markers that are specific to the only people called the Levitical priesthood. That's how they are able to pull all of the priesthood together at this time, which they are doing in Israel. They're pulling the priests together, and the reason they're able to do it is because those DNA markers are showing them they're a priest. So on that day, when it's time for the Ark of the Covenant to come out, what will happen is they will send members of the Levitical priesthood from Judaism in to get it out. And guess what's going to happen? The same thing that happened to Isaiah when he was carrying, when he reached up to stabilize the Ark of the Covenant when the oxen stumbled and the cart shook. What happened to him? He died instantly, man. He was toast, okay? So what will happen is if you are a member, if you are a child, based, you are a Jew, Levitical of the descendant of the Levitical priesthood, based on your DNA, but you have become born again, then that Ark of the Covenant, God will still be doing what he said. He says, I am God, I change not. The, the DNA is the marker, and that is what will enable Gentiles to bring the Ark of the Covenant out of its hiding place. But you have to be born again. It can't be just any Gentile. You have to be born again. Because that's when you are a new creation. Your DNA still says that you're a Kohanim. But now you are a new creation within the priesthood of the Kohanim. Okay? And that's that's how that will work. Because God says, I am God, I change not. Now then, the last verse is Proverbs 25, verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings to search it out. As we go through this teaching this, <clears throat> this morning, we're going to be searching out. You're going to be fulfilling your position as a king. Okay? We're going to be searching out the truth. Now this word right here, this is Bereshit. And if you know this, you, if you read Hebrew, you recognize this word right away. It's the very first word in the Bible, in Hebrew. And uh, Bereshit, as you know it, is in Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. 
Now, it means beginning. So bear a sheet in the beginning. That's where that's tied together. Now then, the, you find it is in the very first sentence, but the interesting thing about the Torah is the Hebrew, they're all three consonant words. They're basically three consonant words. Like, for instance, uh, Shva is seven, and that's a shin, a bet, and a yin. But you change one vowel in it, and all of a sudden, it becomes creator, shova, and that's creator. So because of that, there's a lot of, of confusion on some of the words that you see in Hebrew. But this, the letter bet, the, uh, at the beginning of the word, is the letter bet. And the bet is also the root letter for the word house. But it's also the root letter for the word ben, which means son. That's the way it is with all the letters. Ruach. Here's the resh. Right there. That's the resh. And that is the word ruach. And ruach means breath or spirit. The aleph is the root letter. And everybody knows the word abba. Okay. The aleph is the root letter for the word abba. And that means father. And the shin is the root letter for the, uh, for the, um, uh, for the word shalom. And everybody thinks that the word shalom, I keep hitting the wrong button there, uh oh. Everybody thinks that the word shalom is uh, peace. But actually, the word, the Jewish concept, and remember, we're talking Eastern concepts versus Western, con uh, Western concepts. The, the Jewish concept of the word shalom is nothing broken, nothing missing. And that's a wide difference from just peace. Oh, hey, I want peace. Well, you can have peace. I want nothing broken, nothing missing. Okay? Now then, the next, word, the next letter is the Tav. And the Tav is the root letter for Torah or word. And then the most important one, and you can tell... Because that letter is raised above all the rest is the Yud. And the Yud is the root letter for Yah, which is Yahweh or Yehovah. Okay? Now then we're going to look at another place where we find the, the word Bereshit. But if you look, here's the word Bereshit. But if you look, it's in John 1.1. 1, 1. And then, it's a, and then in verse 14. And these two verses are tied very closely together because when John is telling you that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and the Word became flesh, he's telling you Genesis 1.1. And here's how it works. Bear sheet in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God and the Word was with God and the word became flesh. The, t the tie that goes through the Bible is the Messiah. And it started before creation. He entered into a covenant relationship with God before creation to come and do the things that he did. God knew it back then and so did the Messiah. That's why we are told we were known before the foundation of the earth, we were, we were known in the, in the womb before the foundation of the earth. And that's what he's telling us here. John is telling this. He's saying, hey guys, and you have to understand, he's speaking to an audience who understands the history. Okay? He's speaking to an audience who understands the history. And that's why this is so important. Let's take a look at another example. Here we see Genesis 1.1 in both English and in Hebrew. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew says, Bereshit bara Elohim, et ha-shamayim et ha-aretz. Now what that is talking about is, um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But if you'll count the letters, there's seven of them. Or count the words, there's seven of them. Let's superimpose this over a menorah. 
Now then, here you've got what is called the shamish. Now in Hebrew, a shamish is a servant. Okay? If, if when you go into a uh, synagogue, the person that greets you at the door and, and helps out, they're a shamish. Okay? And that means servant. But the interesting thing is the servant candle is the center candle. And you use it to light all the rest of the candles with. So every time that you sit down and you light the other candles with the servant candle, you're proclaiming to the world that Yeshua is the light of the world. Okay? That's how this, that's, you see how we're, how this is going through, there's everything is tied back to God. And the more that you get into this and the more you see the feast and the festivals or the moeds, you're going to see those ties and you're going to go, wow, I could have had a V8. Okay? Now then, we're going to look at this one right here. It says, Bereshit bara Elohim. Now right here is Bereshit, but if you notice, these three letters right here are the exact same as three, three letter right here. But these three letters are different. Those three letters are for the word seven, Shiva. Okay? But it's pronounced sheet. Okay, so it's different, but it's the same. So you have, and then here, just a minute, uh, keep hitting the wrong button. There. Uh, Bera right here, can you pull that mic down just a little bit? The house mic, it's, uh, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Yeah. Um, so right here is Bera, but the same word is right here. So with that in between, bara means created. Seven, created, Elohim. Everybody, does everybody know what Elohim means? Okay, that's God. So it says, in the Hebrew it says, created seven, created God. Well, what was seven? Seven days. So it's showing us in the Hebrew that God created in seven days. Okay, that's what it's telling us right there. And then we have this part right here. And right here, this is Hashamayim Vayet Haaretz. Now, Haaretz is the earth, the land. Okay? Hashamayim is the heavens. So we have the heavens and the earth there. Okay? Now then, watch this. This right here is the Aleph in the Tav. The Aleph in the Tav has a very significant point. Now notice, it is above the Shamish. The Aleph and the Tav also has a Greek counterpart. Okay? So look at where it is. The Alpha and the Omega, if the Greek counterpart, the Hebrew counterpart, and it was in Hebrew before it was in Greek, it's the Aleph and the Tav, then that tells you right there that the Shamish is the Aleph and the Tav who is the Alpha and the Omega, and who, is to, we to, who are we told that the Alpha and the Omega is? Yeshua. That's right. Okay? Okay, now here we go again. This time we're going to focus in and hone in a little bit better because now you know in that other image, Yeshua was between, here he is, the Alpha, the Alpha and the Tav, and he's between Elohim, Pay close attention. He's between Elohim on this side and he's on between the Hashamayim and the Haaretz on the other side. That's him as intercessor between us and Yehovah. Now all of this is just in the seven, the first seven words of the Bible. Okay? Isn't this amazing? Now then, we're going to focus in, there's the Aleph and the Tav and the Alpha and the Omega, and we're going to focus in on this last part of that verse because this is where it gets really, really incredible. I mean, you know, you, you see, you hear that, uh, that guy, he says, oh, wow, that's incredible. Well, this truly is incredible. Okay. Now then, here you have the Hashamayim Va'et Ha'aretz. Now here's the Aleph in the Tav. 
but right next to it, and on one side you have the heavens, and then on the other side you have the earth. But right next to it, you have a vav. Now, a vav is a Hebrew letter that has some very interesting characteristics. Number one, its numeric value is six. Now, six is the number of man in his fallen state. But look where it's close to. Man in his fallen state. You have the Aleph and the Tav with a Vav attached to it. Man in his fallen state. But look at this. It's suspended between the heavens and the earth. Who was suspended between the heavens and the earth when they were crucified? So here we have the entire story of the crucifixion in the first seven words of the Bible. Okay? Now, I was sharing with the pastor uh, even more. There's, there are so many, there is so much hidden in just that first, the first five books. It's amazing. Have you, who has heard of the Bible code? Okay. The Bible code, the rabbis for centuries... From the very, as long as time existed, the rabbis have talked about a hidden code in the Bible. But there was never enough, uh, there was never a way to dig it out because computers hadn't been invented. <laughs> because it is a numerical based system. God is, I mean, he's like a computer. Uh, our brains are like a computer. We're told we only use 5% of them. Just think how it would be if we used... Even 10%. I mean, amazing, amazing. So, from what you've seen so far, you've seen the resurrection and the crucifixion, that it was established long before the beginning of time. Now, the reason that this is so important is because this all points to the covenantal relationship that was put in place through the Moeds, the Feasts and the Festivals. Now then, I use, I will be referring to some ancient writings. Uh, a lot of people get nervous when people start talking about anything but the Bible. But in Judaism, we have a saying, the Bible is all truth, but not all truth is in the Bible. So there are ancient, ancient writings that we often refer to in Judaism that, that bring out a lot of stories that a lot of people, in fact, the one, for instance, what is going on right now in history, there was a preview of it in the book of Yasher. Okay? But a lot of people don't realize that. And if you read the account of the book of Noah, of the story of Noah in the book of Yasher, you see an almost identical picture of what's going on right now. Okay? Now then... Uh, my main source is always, first and foremost, the Tanakh, which is made up of the Torah, the Netavim, and the Ketavim. Now, the Torah is the first five books. The Netavim are the prophets, both the latter and the, and the greater. And then the Ketavim it has a very interesting uh, de definition to it. The Ketavim is another word for Ketubah. Does every, everybody know what a ketubah, anybody know what a ketubah is? Okay, a ketubah is a marriage contract, okay? And so you want to use the, uh, what it's showing us is that the Tanakh is a ketubah with God's people. That's what it is. Our Bibles are a marriage contract with God. Okay? That's our marriage contract. That's everything we need to know right there. Okay? And I also use the Netzarim text, what you guys call the New Testament. Now, I don't... Uh, I used to, used to take Bibles, and I'd have somebody bring up, the, bring up their Bible, and I hurt somebody's feelings when I did that, so I don't do that anymore. But what I would do is I would take the Bible, and I'd say, okay, everybody turn to the page that divides the New Testament from the Old Testament. And everybody would do that. And I'd take the Bible that the person had handed me, and I'd tear out that page. 
And they would, uh, you know, like they were going to have a coronary. And I said, now you have a Bible. Because there is no division. There is no New Testament. The Bible is the Bible. And it, there's no division between it. And if you can get that out of your mind, you're going to learn very quickly how important and how all of this is related and how it all ties together and how it's so important that we understand there is no division. The time that God established before time has continued and will continue long after time ceases to exist because He is God. There is no change in Him. He tells us, I am God, I change not. And, you, and the writer of Hebrews told us that Yeshua is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when you put a page or a divider between the Old Testament and the New Testament, you remove God's ability to be God. Because you're saying, okay, God, you acted this way in the Old Testament, and Yeshua acts this way in the New Testament. And you know what that is? That's Marcionism. And did you know that Marcionism was excommunicated from the church because of those views? Okay. So it's important that we understand that God does not change. And we are all tied together with Him. Now then, uh, the next book I use is the book of Yasher. And I just mentioned that. And the book of Yasher is mentioned in Joshua 10 and in uh, 2 Samuel 1. Now all the books that I do use that are ancient writings, they're mentioned in the Bible. There's only one that isn't, and it's the book of Enoch. But we all know that Enoch was here, he walked with God, and then he was not. Okay? And we don't know why he was not, but we just know that he was not. We don't know if he died, we don't know if he was raptured, we don't know what happened to him. But we know he was not. So they don't really know, but the book of Enoch is still around. And it's got a lot of information in it that I believe also applies to today. The last one that I look at is the book of Jubilees. And this one is not mentioned. Uh, this one is also not mentioned in the Bible. But the book of Jubilees is, they believe it was written by Moses. And it's considered semi-canonical by the Jewish rabbis. So it's utilized a lot in their writings. Now then, the, these, these, what we're fixing to look at is the biblical feast. And these are called Moeds. And God has commanded us to celebrate them. In Leviticus 23, 1 through 2, the Lord told Moses, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feast. Now a lot of people say, Oh, we don't do that. That's the Jewish thing. Those are the Jewish feasts. Okay? According to God... They're His. Okay? They're His. They don't belong to the Jews. They don't belong to the Gentiles. They belong to God. They're His feast. And we are to honor those feasts. Every single one of them is a covenantal relationship for a specific time that takes place throughout the Jewish year, throughout the Christian year. The Christian year and the Jewish year are the same. The only difference is that the Christians are going by the Gregorian calendar, so their year is off. Okay? <laughs> so, anyway, and we'll fix that. We'll fix that. <laughs> but anyway, these are the spring, these are the spring, uh, spring moeds. You have Pesach, which is Passover. You have Chag, Hamatzah, or Matzot, which is plural, Matzot is plural. Uh, which is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then you have the Feast of Bikarim, which is the Feast of First Fruits. Tonight at sundown, it's the Feast of Bikarim, the Feast of First Fruits. Because tonight it's at sundown, we have Sivan 6 begin, and it is always on Sivan 6. That's why I say the Christian calendar is off. The Jewish calendar has got it, lines right up with the feast. Okay? So, but you'll figure that out as we go along. Now then, the next one is Shavuot, which is Pentecost. I'm sorry, Shavuot is Pentecost, and that's today. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, and it's Pentecost. Now, the ties between Shavuot and Pentecost are the ties that you guys 
are going to be extremely interested in because these are the ties that tie everything back to, to Moses. I can show you in the ancient writings where they go back before creation, but they are introduced to the people and recorded in the Bible in Mos at the time of Moses. The last one is uh, last the fall feast are Yom Teruah, Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, and Sukkot, the Feast of Ingathering. Now then, you guys are going to see Yom Teruah, Feast of Trumpets, because that's when the Messiah comes. Now you can say, oh, Michael, no. You can't. You don't know. Let me tell you. You know what another phrase for Yom Teruah is among the Jewish people? The time that no man knows. What are we told in the Netzarim text? Yeshua tells us, nobody knows when, it's, when the Messiah is going to come, when this is, all these things are going to happen. Only the Father knows. This Yom Teruah is the feast that is known as the time that no man knows. And the reason it's that way is because all of the Moeds begin at the time of the new moon, except for that one. That one's the one that's different. And there's a three-day period there that the new moon occurs that they don't know exactly when it's going to happen. Even up until today, they don't. So I can tell you, I can tell you, you need to know the Jewish calendar because at Yom Teruah, you guys may not be looking for him, but I am. Okay? Because it, he tells us that's when he will come. And that's when, now we don't know what year, but there is also a prophecy within the Jewish, uh, Jewish people that says that he will, be, he will come either on a Shemitah year or the first year of the next Shemitah cycle. Now at the end of this Jewish year, we begin a Shemitah year. And I find that very interesting with all the things that are going on right now, that we're entering into a Shemitah year this next year. So we have, according to Jewish prophecy, two years that there's a good possibility, a very high possibility, that we will see the return of the Messiah in one of those two years. Okay? Now, I'm not giving you dates. I'm not saying, don't, don't go, oh, well, Rabbi Michael, he's Jewish, and he said this is when, no, I'm not. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there's a good possibility. Okay? I don't quote dates. Okay? But that's, the, if you read what the Bible says and you understand the Hebrew aspects of it, then you're going to know things before your neighbor does. So it's good to know. I like to know. And then another one, and incidentally, this is not the Jewish Christmas. And we don't use Hanukkah bushes. Okay? Hanukkah is a celebration of the Maccabees and the, and the thing that occurred with the temple and their destruction, uh, the, the Maccabees defeating the, uh, the battle, winning in a battle that they were supposed to lose because of faith. They maintained their faith. They had faith in God, and they won. And Hanukkah is the celebration of that. And it falls. It doesn't fall at Christmas every year, but sometimes it does. But it is not the Jewish Christmas. And every time somebody says, oh, you celebrate the Jewish Christmas. That, oh, you celebrate Hanukkah. That's just the Jewish Christmas. I say, Father, please keep me from throttling this person. <laughs> okay? I don't want to lay hands on him with my heart in the frame that it is in at that time. Okay? Because then you guys will have to come along behind me and lay hands on him to heal him back up. Okay? But this is not the uh, Hanukkah. Hanukkah is not the uh, Jewish Christmas. These are the, but these are the Moeds. These are what you need to really pay attention, pay close attention to, because they are the Moeds. In the Hebrew, this word is Moed, Kadosh, Kodesh, I'm sorry, Moed, Kodesh, Mikra. And what that means is a called out, holy appointment. Now I want, to th want you to think about it like this, because this is, this is like, this is on God's calendar, 
Okay? This is like he's opening up his day book. Okay, what are we going to do? Ah, this evening it's going to be Shavuot. This is the point in time. Now, he sent out all the invitations. Here it is. Okay? The question is, are you going to be like all Charlie Brown's friends and never go to his, her, his parties when you get the invitation? Are you going to go, are you going to, go to God and, and, and have this special meeting with Him today? Okay? Because He's having a celebration. Are you going? You've been invited. Now then, very few people realize that the Moeds are tied to the harvest season. And this is very important. Here's the Jewish year right here. And you start the Jewish year here in Nisan. And you have the Yar, Savan, Tammuz, Ab, Alel, Tishrei, Heshvan, Kishlev, Tebeth, Shebet, and Adar. Now, Elul is always right prior. This is the month of introspect. And Tishrei, that is usually when you have Yom Teruah. The Yom Teruah will probably occur in Tishrei. Because that's when it is. Okay? And so, but Nisan, this, is, this period right here is very important. And here's why. You have the month of Sivan, which today, today is going to be Shavuot. And it's in the month of Shavan. But in Nisan, you have the barley harvest. In Siv the month of Sivan, you have the wheat harvest. Then you have the grape harvest, the olive harvest, the date and figs harvest, the early rains, the plowing, the barley so winter, wheat and barley sowing, the winter rains, the almond harvest, the citrus harvest, and the latter rains. Now, do you get the idea that, the, that God is very concerned with harvest? Because the Jewish calendar is built around harvest. Okay? Now then, let's, let's put the uh, Moeds in. Here you have Passover. Passover was right here on the 14th of Nisan. Then you have First Fruits, which was the very next day. And First Fruits is very important too. Then you have Shavuot. But look, Shavuot is tied to the wheat harvest. Now you have the Passover. Think about this. Passover is tied to the barley harvest. Does, that, does, that, does anybody understand what the barley harvest? Do you guys, are you familiar with what the barley harvest is? Right, right. But the barley is used in reference mostly to the Jewish people. The wheat is used in reference to the Gentile people. Okay? So we have the barley harvest at Passover with first fruits. And then we have Shavuot, seven weeks later. And another interesting thing occurs at that time. But we're not going to talk about that right now. Then you have Yom Teruah with the dates and figs harvest. And the, uh, Yom, Yom Kippur and Sukkot are the early rains. And then you have the plowing and everything like that. And then we start the year all over again. What is Shavuot? Well, it, we know it begins at sundown. We know that it's tomorrow. We also know that in Exodus 23.16, it's called the Chag Hatser, the Feast of Harvest. Now remember, it's tied to the wheat harvest, the Gentiles, the wheat harvest. And it's called the Chag Hatser, the Feast of Harvest. In Numbers 28.26, it's called Yom Bikarim, or the Day of the First Fruits. Okay. But it is not the same. The day of first fruits is not the day same as Shavuot. Jews also called it the Feast of Weeks, and Christians call it Pentecost. Now let's take a look at the non canonical books. And the first one we're going to talk about is the book of Yasher. Now then, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read to you an event and this and understand. And I'm going, to try and, I'm going to try and hurry up and get you out of here before 5 o'clock this afternoon, okay? <laughs> but uh, the, the event that I'm getting about ready to read to you about is, is in the book of Yasher, chapter 6, verse 11. 
And the reason that I'm reading from the book of Yasher and I'm reading this event is because there's something phenomenal that takes place at this time and you're not, you're, you're going to hear this and you're going to think, ooh, I know that, I know that. And then when I tell you when it, when it happened, you're going to go, I didn't know that. Okay. On that day, the Lord caused the whole earth to shake and the sun darkened and the foundations of the world raged and the whole earth was moved violently. And lightning flashed. And the thunder roared. Sound familiar? Yeah. Okay. And all the fountains in the earth were broken up. Such as was not known to the inhabitants before. And God did this mighty act in order to terrify the sons of men. That there might be no more evil upon the earth. And this event was the launching of Noah's Ark. But you thought, hey, that was at the crucifixion. And it was. It was at Pentecost also. And it was also at Mount Sinai when the word was given to, to Moses. Okay? When God has something that he wants to make a point about, we see the earthquake we see the wind blow. We see thunder and lightning. He's making a point. Hey guys, this is important. Pay attention. It's me, God. I'm trying to get your attention here. That's how important this is. We don't normally think of Noah's Ark in terms of the Moeds because primarily the Moeds were introduced during the Mosaic period. But the Moeds were also introduced at the beginning of time. And in the book of Jubilees, it begins with the story of Noah, but it also tells us, and the new moon of the third month, he, Noah went forth from the ark and built an altar on that mountain. He, Yehovah, gave to Noah and his sons a sign that there should not again be a flood on the earth. He set his bow in the cloud for a sign of the eternal covenant there should not again be a flood on the earth to destroy it all the days of the earth. And in the, in the King James it says, He will never again destroy the earth because of the sins of man. He destroyed the earth because of the sins of man. That's why it said in the book of Yasher, he was talking about the uh, trying to scare the people into doing, not doing evil. And it didn't work. Okay? But here he's telling us, never again will he destroy it. Now then, the rainbow is one of God's covenantal signs. He made a covenant on that day. And that was the sign he put up there. How do you think he feels about what the rainbow is being used for today? Don't you think he might be getting a little bit miffed? Okay. For this reason, it is ordained and written on the heavenly tablets that they should celebrate the Feast of Weeks in this month once a year to renew the covenant every year. See, that's what you're doing when you celebrate Shavuot. You're renewing the covenant that God made with the earth and his covenantal sign is the rainbow. How many of you see a rainbow? I bet we could go out there right now and probably see three or four. May need to start building an ark before the end of the week. Oh, no, we can't do that. He said he wouldn't destroy the earth because of water again. Okay. Jubilee 6, 18. And, the whole f and this whole festival was celebrated in heaven from the day of creation. Okay? These aren't new things. There's nothing, when he says there is nothing new under the sun, he wasn't just a kidding. Okay? There's nothing new under the sun. This festival was not a spontaneous event. It was the ordained before creation. Creation. I've got a chart, and I 
didn't put it in the presentation because I knew we were pressed to time. And like I said, I want to try and get you guys out of here by five. But this chart is actually a breakdown of the history of all of the people. And you can see in this lineup where they overlap. Did you know that Abraham knew Shem? And Shem was the son of one of the, uh, Shem was the son of Noah. But he knew him. Abraham knew him. And Isaac went to, the, to Shem's school of the prophets. And we're talking a 400-year period. Okay? And this, when you see this chart, it's like, whoa! These people knew each other. And they did. They knew each other. Now this statement is very interesting in uh, Jubilee 6.21. For it is the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of First Fruits. This feast is twofold and of a double nature, according to what is written and engraven concerning it, celebrate it. Okay? And the reason that they're saying that it's twofold in nature, a double nature, is because Shabuot can also be the word for feast of oaths. God made an oath. He said that He would not destroy the world with water again for the sins of man. That's the feast of oath. And the reason we renew that covenant is as a reminder to him, hey, you said you wouldn't do that. Okay? He doesn't need to be reminded, but that's the only way that he can communicate with us most of the time. Is he says, please remind me. Remind me. Okay? For I have written in the book of the first law, and here again, guys, this is, remember, we're talking about Noah's time. For I have written in the book of the first law, and that which I have written for thee, that thou should celebrate in its season one day in the year, and I explain to thee its sacrifices, that the children of Israel should remember and should celebrate it throughout the generations in the month, one day in every year. Now, did anybody notice a word that I used in that, that you think, hmm, that word's out of place? The word children of Israel. They didn't exist at that time. The children of Israel did not become the children of Israel until after Jacob was born. But yet, the writer here of Jubilees is telling them that's what God did. And He did this with forethought toward the children of Israel. Now this is a reference to, to God giving the Torah to Moses on Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is an important place. Okay? We need to remember it because we're going to see some things, a comparison, because when I, the comparisons between Mount Sinai and Mount Zion, that's where Shavuot is going to come together for you. The next major event we're going to look at is Egypt. Enter Moses, Exodus 19. Now the story of Moses in the Ten Words, what we call the Ten Words or the Ten Commandments, this story is as eternal as it can possibly get. Okay, everybody knows. Even if you're not a Christian, you know about Moses and the Ten Commandments. Thanks to this guy right here. Okay? Charlton Heston immortalized the Ten Commandments. Okay? And the wilderness of Sinai in Exodus 19 is the place where the Mosaic Covenant was actually implemented. And it started with Jehovah telling Moses, Okay, people, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians? I can do that again. Yes, amen. Okay? If you will be obedient and keep my covenant, then you will be a special treasure to me above all people. When you become born again, you become a special treasure to God above all people. And he is telling us that right here. And, and this passage is one of my favorite stories. And it starts in Exodus 19. And I'm not going to read the whole thing to you because it's long. But there are certain points that I want to bring out. It says, And the Lord God said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you so they will believe you forever. 
Okay, now he's, he's talking to him. He's telling Moses, when you come up to see me, I'm going to cover the mountain with smoke, and there's going to be thunders, and there's going to be lightnings, and the reason there's going to be that is so we can scare the bejeebies out of those people, and they'll pay attention to what you're going to say. Okay, that's what he's telling him. And, of course, that's Mike Saunders' interpretation. Hey, but if it works, you know, any port and storm. And it says, Then it come to pass on the third day, in the morning there were thunderings and lightnings and a cloud of thick smoke on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. See what I mean? It scared the bejeebies out of them. Now Mount Sinai was completely covered in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quite greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses said, and God answered him by his voice. We call out to God. We call out to God. And people say, well, I don't know. I don't hear. But how are you calling out to God? You call out to God and then you sit and you listen. You don't keep coming. Hey, God, did you hear me? God, I got this problem, man. This is really getting big. And are you only going to him with your problems? There's a Jewish thought. Do you have problems because you pray? Or do you pray because you have problems? Okay? So how are you calling out to God? Are you calling out to him with the same thing over and over and over and over. If it's not working, something's wrong. Okay? Sit back and look at what you're asking. It's very important because especially today, I got news for I got news for everybody, not just believers, everybody. The only thing that is going to get us out of this mess that this country is in right now is prayer. And it can't be these, well, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. We need good, hard-hitting people that are ready to get in and run to the battle. Just as King David, when he was going to fight Goliath, he ran, and what did he do? He grabbed five smooth stones out of the brook, and he put them down in his slingshot, and he was running, and then he let go of that thing, and what happened? Goliath dropped like a rock. And the reason that we are at a point that our prayers are not being where they need to be is because we aren't running to the battle. We're taking a defensive position, and we cannot be in a defensive position. We have to be in a fighting position. When he was running and swinging that thing, how many of you have ever used a slingshot? I made slingshots like that for my grandsons. And we had a blast out in the backyard. And by the time, we got, by the time they went back to Connecticut where they lived, those boys were good with that slingshot. Okay? But they taught, I taught them how to use them, and they ran to give, build up momentum. So when they slung that thing and let go of that, that piece and that rock got sailing around there and it would hit those metal pipes that they were shooting at and it hit that pipe and go bing and they knew in a minute they had hit it. How many targets have you heard lately that go bing when you were praying? Okay. We have got to get up and run to the battle because what's going on is going to take out our country if we're not. And God sanctified this country for a reason. We are to be a light to the world. And we are part of the reason that in the word where it says all of Israel was saved. It was because there were people who were praying and fighting. And standing with them in the things that were going on. You've got to be ready to run to the battle. Now then. The thing about this is God answered him by his voice. And the most amazing thing to me about this passage in Exodus is that now all the people witnessed the thunderings. It tells us that all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood far off. Boy, man, I'd be on the front row of that show. 
I mean, I'd be saying, what is, look at this. This is amazing. This is the greatest fireworks I've seen in my life. And they're back there hiding somewhere. And they told Moses, you speak to God, and then you come and speak to us, and we'll listen to you. But don't let God speak to us, lest we die. Now this is the only time in history when an audience of over 600,000 people can hear the voice of Yehovah at one time, and they say, no thank you. I just shake my head. I think, holy cow. But you know what? How many people do you think today, if they could hear the voice of God, if they had the opportunity to hear what He had to say, how many of them would rush to hear Him say it? How many of them would turn loose of a lifestyle that is degenerative in nature and rush to hear what the words of God are? To see if maybe, maybe that it's not a lifestyle, maybe it's a sin. Okay? At this point, the Israelites were verbally given the Ten Words or the Ten Commandments. The tablets were not physically presented until Exodus 31 verses eight, uh, verse 18. And that's when the people made the golden calf. That was their response. They were given the Ten Commandments verbally, and then when, God, when uh, Moses goes up to get the tablets off of the mountain, and he's up there for 40 days, the people say, he's not coming back, let's make a golden calf. After all they saw that was done in Egypt, and they made a golden calf. How many golden calves do we have made today? This is the first time that recorded since Noah that Yehovah appeared. Now, prior to this, and you have to keep in your mind, how many of you have ever thought of a post-Edenic relationship with God? Not a current relationship with God, but post-Edenic. You have Adam and Eve, they've been cast out of the Garden of Eden, they've been up until that point, they had a face-to-face -face with Him anytime they wanted. Hey God, how you doing today? Oh, it's a beautiful day in the Garden. It's good to see you. No, I've got everything I need. That's Garden of Eden. Okay, but now they're out of the Garden of Eden. Have you ever thought about what communication would be like at that point? We sort of take for granted that the way we communicate with God is always the way it's been. But it wasn't. Because look at what happened with Noah. Do you know how long it took him to build the ark? 120 years. Do you think God said, Noah, what's going on down there? How come it's taking you so long? It wasn't that way. He had a different type of relationship. God appeared to them physically even then. That's still, and that's recorded. He still, that was the way he made his appearance. It wasn't until after the flood that they limited, he limited the life of man to 120 years. And he took away the opportunity of immortality, which had already been pretty much taken away from him. But we do, according to some of the ancient writings, evidently there was still some going back and forth. It was sort of like God was in the Garden of Eden and he had a doorbell. And you walked up to it and you hit the doorbell and God came out and said, yeah, what can I do for you? It was sort of like that. Because the Garden of Eden, according to some of the ancient writings, it was still a physical manifestation of it. Because the Garden of Eden was a small little patch in a big place called Eden. Okay? And we think of the Garden of Eden as being the whole thing. But it wasn't. It was a small little patch in Eden. And that's how that, that's how that was set up. But anyway... We have, when God appeared to Noah, this is the first time, I mean to uh, Moses, this was the first time since Noah that there was a verbalization from God that was audible. Okay? It's the first time. And he, 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 he uh, sealed it with thunders, lightnings, 
clouds of smoke. He sealed it with all of that. He said, Moses, this is me. Boom. Okay. Now then in Matthew, the next time it happens is in Matthew 27, verses 50 through 52. And Yeshua cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was split in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked and rocks were torn apart. And the tombs were opened and many bodies of the Kedushim who were sleeping were raised to life. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over the tomb that Yeshua was in, when they saw the earthquake, I mean not the tomb, that it, who were keeping guard over the cemetery, um, when they saw the earthquake and what was happening, they became terribly frightened. They knew God was saying something because they, in that period, they recognized earthquakes and things like that as being words from God. This occurred... The other thing is, this occurred, now think about this, this occurred when the Mashiach released his spirit. Okay? Now we know, according to Ephesians, that he descended into hell. Do you think he went peacefully? Or was there a battle that ensued as he went to take the keys of the kingdom away from Satan, the keys to life and death away from Satan? Do you think Satan says, okay, here you go, Jesus. You, I've been the boss for long enough, you can take it now. No, there had to be a battle. So it stands to reason that if there's a battle, that the earth quaked. Okay? Another interesting passage. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. Now, I've always found that interesting that he sat on that stone. And I was talking, uh, talking about it in our meeting yesterday. And a lady said, and I was sort of joking, and I said, I wonder if he got tired, if he sat on it because he was tired, or he was afraid it might roll back over the tomb and then Jesus couldn't get out. And she said, she, she said, uh, she says, Rabbi, she says, sitting is a, and, and when she said this, I thought, that's wisdom. And she said, when you sit down, that is taking a position of submission. And the angel sat down on the stone because he knew that people were going to be coming and looking for the Messiah. And he didn't want to terrify them. He wanted them to see with peace that the Messiah had risen from the grave. And so he sat down on the stone so when they came up, they would not be terrified by this giant honking angel with these big wings out to yonder standing and probably scaring the bejeebies out of them. So they run away and they say, oh, you stay over there, I'll stay over here. No, they went right up to him and he told them because he was not intimidating. He sat down in a position of submission. Now, like I said, an earthquake, that too was a major event. Now then, here we have Acts 2 verses 1 through 6 and this is tongues of fire when the day of Shavuot now remember Shavuot on the day of Shavuot had come they were all together in one place now we also know that at this day this was when the resurrection this was after the resurrection and uh, the, the Messiah after the ascension and the Messiah had said that there would be the Holy Spirit that would come. So they were, the disciples were expecting something, but they didn't know what it was. Now, Shavuot is also, is called Chag, a Chag, okay? Chag, not Chag, a Chag, okay? And a Chag is a Moed, when used in a Moed, is a Moed that you travel to Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was full of all of the men that were Jews, that were Jews during that period, Jerusalem was full. The temple was, was full of people because you took your, your offerings to the temple. Now it says that they were in the house and they were seated in the house when suddenly from heaven there, were, there was a sound like a mighty rushing wind and then tongues like fire settled or was spreading out and appeared on them and settled on them and that each 
uh, they were all filled with the Ruach HaKodesh and began to speak in other tongues as the Ruach, Ruach enabled them to speak. And then it tells us, it says, now there were Jewish people who were staying in Jerusalem. Of course, they were staying in Jerusalem because it was a Chag. Okay? It was Shabuot. And they had to be, for there to be this many people. Now, a lot of people say, well, they were at, they were at the upper room. No, they weren't. They weren't in the upper room because where they were, there were 3,000 people. And you couldn't get 3,000 people in the upper room. And the way we know is there are 3,000 people because there's 3,000 people that became saved. And when this sound came, the crowd gathered and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in their own language. Now then, remember it says, suddenly there came from heaven. This was not a breeze blowing through. This was a sudden downburst of power and authority that hit these guys. It was like something they had never seen before. Okay? It was totally different. But yet the, it, it had to be different, but yet it had to be so powerful that it would draw other people to it. And that's exactly what happened because it was a noise. But it was at earth level. And it was so loud that the people, the other people who were in, the men who were bringing their gifts, they said, what's going on over there? Hey, look, over there, doesn't that look like Peter? Golly, look at that. Look at those guys over there. Look at all that heat going on over there. Let's go over there and see what's happening. And so they go over, and they're talking to them, and Peter tells them, that man, Yeshua, that you guys crucified, he was the Messiah. And in that process, 3,000 men became saved. And that's an important number. This is the timeline of the three months that occurred. Now then, you have the barley feast. Here's the crucifixion. And we have salvation that comes after the crucifixion. This green line is first fruits right here. And then you have the feast of unleavened bread. That's seven days. Now then, when they, left ex when they made the exodus, that was three days after Passover or three days after first fruits, one day after Passover. We find the resurrection three days after first fruit, or after Passover. There's the resurrection. We have seven weeks of seven, which that's what the Feast of Weeks are. It's seven weeks of seven. And here is the ascension. The ascension took place ten days before the wheat harvest. And here is Shavuot, the 50th day or the day of Jubilees, the sixth of Sivan. Here we have... On Mount Zion, the Torah was given on the 6th of Sivan. That's when Moses went up on the hill and he gave him the Torah. We also have on the Shavuot, at, uh, 2,000 years later with the Messiah, we have the Holy Spirit given. There were also the disciples were endued with power from on above. Now this, this Exodus right here, do you know why? Do you know why? Pharaoh went after the Egyptian, uh, after the Israelites. Do you know why he went after them? He thought they were coming back. He thought that was the agreement that he had with Moses. They go out three days, they come back three days. They come back after three days. The reason that Moses went after, I mean that Pharaoh went after them was because the, he got word that the tomb of Joseph was empty. Okay? He knew because the tomb of Joseph was empty, they weren't coming back. Because Joseph had made the descendants of um, his brothers promise them, he had made them promise that when they left Egypt, they would take his body and take it with them to be buried in the promised land. So when Pharaoh saw that they were not coming back, go get them. They're our slaves. Three days journey, an empty tomb, and Pharaoh's hold on the people was broken. Bondage, slavery was broken. Three days in the tomb, an empty tomb, and
And Satan's hold on us is broken. Do you see why these covenants are so important? Now here, two loaves. One of the things that they do at Shavuot is they take two loaves of bread. One of barley and one of wheat. The barley comes from all of this which was for the Jews. Yeshua himself, I come for the Jews. That's why I'm here. I'm, for, I'm coming for the Jews. And the woman at the well, what'd she say? Even the, or she, she told him, she said, even the, the dogs eat from the crumbs of the table. Sorry, it wasn't the woman at the well. I'm sorry. Senior slip. But anyway, the point is, he came here for the Jews. But here, the Gentiles are getting ready to be incorporated into the, into the mix. Ten years after the ascension. The, that's when he goes. Ten years was when he went after that, but they went to Cornelius' house. It took ten years for that to, tra- to happen. Okay? A lot of people think that it happened sooner than that. But it wasn't. It was ten years that passed. Because they had so much animosity to overcome against the Gentiles. They did not want, nobody wanted to go see them. Because they would be unclean if they went and saw them. And it took Paul and his revelations to bring the Gentiles in. And let me tell you something. The Jews would say, well, when the Messiah comes, the Gentiles aren't are going to be in, Meg, in the picture. If the Gentiles had not participated in the crucifixion, you would not have the rights to salvation. The Jew and the Gentile. The Jews didn't kill the Messiah. And, and I can go on record as saying that. So if y'all have any problem, you know, you can tell anybody that says, oh, the Jews, you no, know, Rabbi, he's Jewish. He said the Jews didn't do it. Because if the Jews had done it, then where would the Gentiles be when it came time for salvation? You had to be there. You had to have your hand on the hammer that hit the nails into his hands. You had to be a part of that. Because otherwise salvation would have only been for the Jews. Okay? Now then, here's the loaves. These two loaves right here are offered as a part of the sacrifice at Shavuot. One is barley, one is wheat. So, are you all a part of the covenant? You bet you are, because you're right there. You're a part of it. Okay, now then, let's look at this slide real quick, and I'm just about to wrap up. Uh, I can't read this down here, it's too small. Okay, now then, we have the uh, giving of the mitzvah at Mount Sinai, and then we have the giving of the Holy Spirit at Mount Zion. Now, the mitzvah is the laws, okay? On this column right here, this is what happened during Moses at Mount Sinai. This is what happened at Mount Zion. The Israelites given the Ten Commandments, not the tablets, just the verbalization, the Ten Commandments. Here, the, heart, the word was written on the hearts of men instead of on tablets of stone. That was at Mount Zion at Pentecost. Here, God appears marked with sound, flames of fire, and mountain smoking. Here, God gave the Spirit with tongues of fire and sound of rushing wind. See? Fire and wind. Birthday of Judaism. Birthday of the church. Receiving the Torah made the Israelites a cohesive group with a priestly calling. Receiving the Spirit made the believers a cohesive group with a priestly blessing. Okay? Great joy in the physical harvest. Great joy in the spiritual harvest. 3,000 died in Exodus 32, verse 28. 3,000 saved in Acts 2, 41. Mount, uh, Mount Sinai, law on the outside. Mount Zion, law on the inside. The Israelites were given Ten Commandments orally. God appeared to them marked with sound, flames of fire, and mountain smoking. Now there's a midrash on Exodus. It says that when God spoke, and this is a Jewish, here again, this is a Jewish midrash. When God spoke and sounded the heavenly shofar, 
the sound waves of his voice became visible to the children of Israel as flames of fire. They divided themselves as God spoke forth to the Torah in the 70 known languages at the world, in the world at that time. Okay? According to the Jewish Midrash, when God spoke, it was accompanied with flames of fire over the people. They saw it. Just like they did here. Okay? Fifty days after leaving Egypt, the Torah was given at Mount Sinai. Israel was made to be a kingdom of priests, a covenant people. First feast of Pentecost marked by sound, flames of fire, and foreign languages. God made the covenant with national Israel. Now then, at Zion, the Ruach HaKodesh, given on the same day the Torah was given. The Holy Spirit came on the day that the Torah was given to Moses. He wrote it on the hearts of men instead of on tablets of stone. It was marked by flames, sound, and multiple languages, just like it was at Sinai. And there were cloven tongues representing the cleansing work of Yeshua. Now then, at Shavuot, there's a poem that is read. And that poem has 97 stanzas to it. Okay? It takes about 45 minutes. That's why I said I'm going to try and get you guys out of here by 5 o'clock. Reading that poem is real long. But I'm not going to read the poem. There's only one verse of it or one stanza of it that really touches me every time I read it. And it's right here. It says, Could we with ink the ocean fill Were every blade of grass a quill Were the wood were the world of parchment made and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry nor would the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky to me this sums up his love his love is so vast that we can't even perceive it. We can't even imagine. Because it is so big. It, it, our minds cannot comprehend the greatness of his love. I want to leave you with one last thing. <clears throat> when I was working on the presentation, I pull a lot of all-nighters. And... I was working one night, uh, a couple of nights ago, and uh, because of the way my mind works, I was raised in a large family, and so I have to have things going on. I can't have noise, but I have to have imagery going on to my sides, so that because I, my brothers and sisters were always running around and all like that, and so I'm used to that, but I found that over time I got to where I couldn't focus if there wasn't something happening. So I have a television that's set up right beside my uh, desk. So out of the corner of my eyes, the images that are going on create enough of, of input into my brain that I can focus on what I'm looking at. And uh, the other morning, it was about 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, somewhere around in there. And um, I was working on the, on the teaching, and... Out of the corner of my eye, I saw something, and the Lord quickened my heart and said, look at this. And I looked over, and there was an actor that I hadn't seen in ages. His name's Dean Jones. Probably some of you even remember Dean Jones. And he's playing, and, and there's no sound on the TV. I'm watching this, and he, he's walking out, and he's all like this, like I walk normally, okay? And he's walking out like this, and, there's a, and his, his focus is a young boy that's running toward him. And immediately... That's Abraham and Isaac. I knew in a minute that was Abraham and Isaac. And as, a, and as I'm watching this play out, and there's no audio, I'm watching this play out, and I'm seeing the Akedah take place. What he's doing is, this is the sacrifice. The Akedah is the sacrifice of Isaac. And so I'm watching this take place. And so he gathers up the wood, and he gathers up the boy, and he gathers up his servant, and off they go. And then he tells the servant, and everybody, this look on the servant's faces, this is incredible. He's, and the servant is saying, I think I know what you're getting ready to do. I think I need to go with you. 
I think I need to stop this. And Abraham, you know, it's like a silent movie that you see, you know, with the Keystone Cops and everything, except he's going, you know, like that. And so the servant stays there, and Abraham takes Isaac, and they go off. And Abraham, Isaac is carrying the, uh, uh, the, carrying the wood. And they, and they stack it up. They make the altar. They stack it up. And you can see this look on Abraham's face. And you can see the pain that he is going through as he's watching his boy. And he knows what he's getting ready to do. And it's, he's, he's hurting and he's aching on the inside because of what he's getting ready to do. How many of you have children? How many of you have grandchildren? Okay. So he goes and he says, and the boy says, and I'm knowing right away, he says, okay, father, where's the lamb? And Abraham says, the Lord providing a lamb. And so I'm thinking, okay, that's the Lord providing a lamb. And so the boy, he's standing there, and Abraham grabs him. He's got the rope in his hand, and he grabs the boy, and he tries to tie his hands up. And the boy jumps away, and he jumps back. You know, and he's saying, father, what are you doing? And the boy's standing there, and he's got the rope in his hands. It's still wrapped around his hands, but it's very loose. It's just hanging there. And he looks at his father, and this look on his face of incredulity, like, what in the world is going on with you? And you look over at Abraham. They show a shot of Abraham, and he's, and he's going, Okay, and he's saying, I know what I have to do. And yes, you are the sacrifice. But if I lay you on that altar and I take your life, then I believe with all my faith that the Lord God will raise you up again. But you can see it on the boy's face. Okay, but he's got his hands there and this rope is loose around it. And the boy looks down at the rope and he looks at his father. He looks down at the rope again. And he looks at his father again. And he goes. And that says it all. Because the Messiah, that's what he did. He didn't need nails and ropes to hold him on that cross. He walked over to God and the ropes were hanging loosely on his arms and he said, here. But we forget that. We forget that every single day. And that's why the world is in the mess it's in. Because Christians have abrogated the authority that God has given them. To express God's love to every single person in the world. We have abrogated our authority to stop the evil that is running rampant through our school systems and through our world every single day. In this country alone, it boggles the mind. In our minds, because of who we are, we cannot perceive the level of depravity that these people are going through and thinking about in their minds because we're good people they can't be doing that oh that doesn't make sense that's horrible why would they do something like that and that's God's blessing to us that we can't think of in thought patterns like that but it doesn't mean that the rest of the world isn't and as believers, we've got to step up to the plate. Because God loves us. And that's the only way anybody else is going to know who God is.